Um, so I, I will introduce myself. This feels a little bit odd, but um, yes, I, I have to do it. So I am uh, Dr. Marina Vélez Vago. I'm an artist, an educator, and a researcher. I am based in Cambridge, UK. I work across areas of contemporary art and sustainability. My practice addresses people's behavior and the social construction of value, placing emphasis on how values affect the protection or... Uh, no. No, 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 no. No, I am not. Um, uh, do we have technical problems? <laughs> It does say you are yes. on mute, yes. Um, no, it's, in, it's in the Zoom. In the Zoom, yeah, it, no, says, no, it says... It's, it's, yeah, it's coming through. I can hear it. Just someone, on the, someone on the chat just said... It is, it, everything is fine. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> excellent. All right. Everything is fine. We like that, don't we? <laughs> So, uh, so just to finish, uh, um, more or less a, uh, an idea of my practice um, um, and to recap the emphasis is on values um, and placing a emphasis on how values affect the protection and or degradation of other species and the environment. I use photography and video to explore and articulate these issues, focusing on the creation of spaces where values can be revised, discussed, and hopefully transformed. So I will be sharing with you a paper called Camelo Park, where um, um, I will be exploring the displacement of the other, particularly the non-human other, but it can also be extrapolated to displacements of everything, of people, of any, any living entities, so how um, how we work with with those displacements and uh, this this idea of othering the other. So what are the mechanisms that are involved in othering, and how can we bring the other closer? Um, welcome refugees, protect other species, and and so forth. Okay. Um, so reflecting a little bit on, um, before I start my paper presentation, reflecting on um, what uh, the new wave of psychology um, uh, calls um, the um, environmental uh, melancholy, and is what uh, we um, feel when uh, we experience loss, um, loss of habitat, uh, loss of uh, the coast, loss of loss of species mm, and looking at uh, and thinking about what can uh, each of us do to um, not shy away from that loss to try to um, stay with the trouble as Haraway will say Don Haraway but not to l be defeated but by, by such um, enormity and and those powerful emotions so as always, uh, art can bring uh, a way of um, dealing with these things, uh, which are sometimes bigger than we are and sometimes overwhelming. So through art and through our practices, we can articulate these very, very difficult issues and remaining entangled in these connections and relationships without the need to denial, resort to denial or, or to run away or to just not want to hear what is happening. Um, so um, I'm going to share with you um, this, uh, this paper and I'm going to open uh, my paper with, an, with a, this image, uh, gives title to the work and um, I believe also illustrates on uh, many levels our relationships, uh, re relationship with non-human animals. And when I say our, as a researcher, I want to, um, I want to position myself. So I am a mixed race. I was born in Argentina. I lived in many countries. I, I moved around. So I myself was displaced um, by choice or maybe not uh, around, the, around different cultures. 
And when I refer to a plural of our, I, in my position, I represent practicing communities because simply because I am one of them. So I cannot speak for them, but I feel one of them. So when I use the plural, that's where I'm coming from. But where, uh, as always, is my own experience. Mm. So let me introduce you to the camelopard or camelopardalis. Um, this word uh, camelopard was originally used to describe the giraffe. It originates from medieval Latin and it is composed by the words camel and leopard as the giraffe was uh, thought to have a head like a camels and spots like uh, leopards. Most artists and naturalists had never seen a giraffe in real life and had to rely on secondhand experiences. So, how, so the question of how do we portray what we don't know how do we imagine the, what we haven't seen? What's the role of imagination? What's the role of representation in our relationship with uh, other uh, non-human animals? And, uh, and we're talking about um, this, this is a medieval um, uh, miniature um, back when a, a time in which science, religion and art were sort of together. Uh, and how we can build bridges between um, the spiritual pursuit, the, the scientific pursuit and the artistic uh, pursuit. So how can we cross pollinate one another uh, in order to create knowledges that are a little bit wider and more complex and more suitable for the problems that we face today. Mm. So um, Illustrators like Johnston's uh, often picture the animal as an actual combination of camel and uh, a camel and a leopard. So this is an illustration found in uh, Jan Johnston's book of natural history. It was published in 1650. This book is an invitation to visit a strange space where science and art and myth mix in equal measure and where artistic and realistic uh, drawings of cows, horses and dogs mixed with fantastic drawings of mythical creatures often portrayed killing and eating humans enhanced by the illustrator's imag imagination so um so in this book we, we see very realistic uh, portraits of, of animals that they knew uh, they were familiar to them and those animals that were unfamiliar they were a little bit uh, not not completely linked to reality um but equally, there was uh, there was a space for the mythical creature, so the um, uh, mandragoras and, and and all these uh, um, unicorns and, and those myth mythical creatures were also portrayed in this uh, encyclopedia of animals, which I find very very <laughs> telling. Um, so this uh, this book is um, I, I'm very very lucky because this book is in the University of Cambridge. We will have it in, in Cambridge. And I was uh, privileged enough to have access to, to this book granted by the librarian uh, of the geological department. And uh, it's, it's an extraordinary um, uh, historical um, information that we have, uh, we have there. So let's um, move um, a little bit more to the contemporary scene. And I chose this, uh, this artist because it's very link, uh, linked to the topic. Contemporary artist uh, Candida Hoffer uses photography as a medium to investigate animals. In her study of captive animals in zoos, Hoffer addresses our collective imagination. And when I say our, I say she as an artist, she, whoever participates as a viewer, she is addressing that, this, this collective imagination or lack of it in relation to the wild in its present state, which appears as something controlled, managed and artificial, where wild animals are kept in painted and sculpted uh, enclosures, which resemble dusty opera theatres. Um, Hofer's photographs of a giraffe in her zoo enclosure offers back to me, the viewer, like Johnson's illustrations, an opportunity to reflect on the capabilities and limitations 
of humans to relate to animals and how these affect them and their habitat. Hofer's photographs raise questions about displacement, domination, and they explore the disconnection between acts of conservation and acts of othering fellow species through emotional distance. Hofer photographs of animals in zoos expand and complement the questioning that the video Camelopard, which I'm going to share with you at the end, intends to put forward. And it's the same questions that I'm going to put forward to the uh, viewers online and, uh, and the uh, participants here present on site. So these are the questions. What value do we or do you place on animals? Why do you or do we place different value on animals according to their usefulness to humans? Is the value of livestock higher than that of a wild, wild animals? Which animals are worthy of being allowed existence and their habitats protected? So to me, the, the work um, addresses those questions by suggesting that it is one's limitations in understanding animals' natures that shapes the relationship with them. So uh, back to this idea of the relationships is not uh, questioning, oh, do I want to get into this relationship? Most probably we are in these relationships already, like uh, Laurie Gruen says. The question is not, do I want to get entangled in this relationship? Is acknowledging the relationship that the question is, how can I make this relationship better? And that applies also for, um, for people and for everybody working in communities, and families, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, with countries. Uh, so how can we live together? How can we make this um, coexisting, coexistence better? So my question is, but in, if certain animals cease to be valuable to humans as means of production, would they be allowed to exist, to reproduce and to in inhabit spaces? The question of usefulness, this is very interesting because it's a, it's a modernist question, but it, it, it is also a political and ethical one. If only humans can act as moral agents where other beings are assigned the value of moral patience, the question remains, as to how and by whom is this distribution of values arranged and implemented. So who decided uh, upon the value of, 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 of animals, of, of certain species? That's, for me, that's a pressing question. Looking at Hofer's photographs elicited in me memories and emotions which created a space of affect and transformation, which transported me to my early childhood. My grandfather taught me to read using the Encyclopedia of Animals, a comprehensive compendium of photographs uh, uh, with st studies and, and data. The images made me want to um, know more about the animals portrayed. They, want, they wanted me to know about their behavior, diet, habits, and social organization. And it was through this encyclopedia that I learned the meaning of the word extinct. I remember the clear emotion prompted by learning that the animal in the image I was looking at was extinct. I was aware as a, as a child that I was a child, but that I was feeling a profound emotion which belonged to the world of, of adults. And I had as a child to negotiate that, not as an angst that will last a, a lifetime, but as a way of understanding and hear a word of, of, of about communities of practices creating knowledges also communities of, of creating knowledge is intergenerational so how much can a child absorb and process and digest and do anything about it and how can we communicate uh, with children these issues these complex complex issues and my question is uh, have i been all my life making an art backwards to that girl 
who for the first time experienced the tremendous solitude of realizing that the speech belonged to was responsible for another species extinction. So this that, that first idea, my realization was that um, when you go that um, as a developmental childhood, that is psychological. So when you first realize that you are a person separated from your mother, and then then okay, but this is your bubble of your of, of your family, and then you extend the community, and eventually the realization that you belong for me came at, at a very early age. You belong to a species, and that for me was really big. But I could grasp it um, somehow. And since then, um, I've been looking at this idea of species and and the the tremendous um, pleasure that I got into realizing also that we were not the human species was not the only species in the, on the planet, and that, oh we're not alone. Oh, there are all these other ways of being in this world. Can we learn from them? What can they tell us? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful wonderful feeling as well. So the work Camelo Part, which is uh, uh, the video I'm going to share with you, asks questions that may be rooted in, in that childhood experience, but that take on a new meaning as we are faced with the Earth's six mass extinction and biological annihilation of unprecedented proportions. As a child, I felt close to animals, and I still do. I still wonder why people invest so much of their imagination into classifying animals as others, using all means of socially constructed negative difference to keep emotional distance between human and humans and non-human animals. Thinking and imagination beyond anthropocentrism would position humans as part of a nature that is extremely fragile and which requires that new empathies and new understandings based on new values are developed in order to protect it. And I'm going to share with you um, a video, which is hopefully, okay, come on, okay. As a world power has practiced consumption of others through a specular or dialectical model of definition of self in opposition to devalued others. These constitutive others are the complement of the subject of modernity. They are the woman the ethnic or racialized other and the natural environment, including animals, plants and forests. The others, as both empirical and symbolic reference of socially constructed negative difference and hence disqualification function as shapers of meaning in so far as they help define the subject by negation. In other words, the mark of difference fulfills the important function of defining and dividing the subjects. But this means that the different others are structurally necessary to the dominant system of meaning. It is consequentially important to disengage the notion and the social practices of difference from the web of relations of power and domination in which they have been functioning for so long. The key term here is complexity. Any argument for multiplicity which does not respect the complexity 
which means the internal dissonances, is merely a quantitative variation of one directional thinking. An intimate and inward looking relationship, framed nonetheless by the dominant human and structurally masculine habit of taking for granted free access to and consumption of the bodies of others, animals included. The ancient metaphysics of otherness rests on an assured political anatomy, according to which the counterpart of the power of reason is the notion of man as rational animal. The question then becomes, how can we respect animals' otherness? How can we address this issue in its imminent and material specificity without falling into the worn out rhetoric of human dignity defined as a denial of our shared animality? My answer is by stepping beyond anthropocentrism to try and look at the world from a dramatically different perspective, which does not assume a passive nature and a consciousness that must be, per definition, human. So, oh, thank you very much. <laughs>